Good morning. It's great to be joining all of you at Nasagawea Presbyterian Church. Even if we are meeting virtually, it's wonderful to be with you this morning. God's glory is everywhere. God is present in all places, in our kitchens, in our living rooms. God is with us wherever we are, and we are brought together in spirit. Let us worship God. Let us pray. O oh, gracious God, we see your wonder in the world around us, in the changing of the seasons, even as days grow darker, as nights grow colder, as we anticipate the coming of snow and winter, we see your majesty in nature. O oh God, in this service today, may we, may we catch a glimpse of you as well. In a refrain from a song, in a thought that stays with us, in a word that strikes our hearts. May we be aware of your spirit here with us moving within us and through us and through everyone joining today. And may we take with us, O oh God, something that will sustain us for the week ahead. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The scripture reading this morning is Matthew 11, verses 25 to 30. At that time, Jesus said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have been hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and have in and revealed them to the infant. Yes, Father, my, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and lean upon me, for my, I am, for my word is gentle and humble and in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, 
and my burden is light. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. There is a Jesus who we think we know. But how might that be different from the Jesus who really was? You know, this is an important thing for a community like the church to think about. Since we claim to be inspired by Jesus and we claim to follow Jesus and we want to emulate Jesus. But we know that some of the ways we think about Jesus probably don't match up very well with who Jesus really was. I'm thinking of those old Sunday school pictures that still hang in many churches across North America. You know the ones I mean, the ones that show Jesus with blonde hair and blue eyes, surrounded by a very dated image of a typical North American Sunday school class. If most of us think about it for even a short while, we probably realize that Jesus didn't have a fair complexion, that he didn't have blonde hair or blue eyes, at least that's highly unlikely. And isn't it funny how those pictures of Jesus look a lot like us? Even his robes look similar to something that one of our ministers or priests might wear. And if we think about it a little bit longer, we might begin to realize how different Jesus was from us. How different his time and his culture was. We might realize that he spoke a different language, one that is very different from English or even other Western European languages. We might even realize that Jesus wasn't a Christian, that he followed another faith, another religion, first century Judaism, which was a bit different from modern Judaism and quite different from modern Christianity. Of course, all of this, you know, has implications. Jesus probably thought about God in a different way than we do. Even though we have some of the same books with which Jesus would have been familiar, he understood and interpreted those books, the Hebrew Bible, differently than the way we do. Even today, we have a tendency to read the Jewish scriptures through Christian eyes, and that sometimes gives us a skewed understanding of what is being said, because in a way it is a kind of religious and cultural appropriation. All of these things make it hard for us to know Jesus as he really was. It makes it hard, hard for us to understand Jesus as he was understood by those who experienced him. And it makes it far more likely that we base our religion or our religious ideas on a Jesus that we think we know rather than on the Jesus who really was. It's easy to think we know someone, isn't it? Even in the time and place in which Jesus lived, there were those who thought they knew all about Jesus. But you know, they really couldn't see or hear what Jesus was about. In the passage that we read today from Matthew, we encounter Jesus near the beginning of his public ministry and he's already being criticized. You see, many of the religious people of Jesus' day had an idea what a religious teacher or a prophet should be like. They were expecting a great leader, a Messiah, and they had ideas about the kind of person that that Messiah would be as well. And although people were starting to say many of these things about Jesus, trying to figure out who he was, maybe he was a teacher, maybe he's a prophet, maybe he's even the Messiah, to the religious people of his day, Jesus didn't seem to fit the bill. Not only did he seem pretty ordinary, but he didn't seem very religious. 
He mostly seemed to enjoy the time that he spent with folks who were definitely not religious, at least not by the standards of the really religious people. And many of those religious folks, those regular churchgoers of Jesus' day, and the important religious leaders couldn't see the real Jesus. So they dismissed him. They attacked his character and they spread rumors about him. To the really religious people of Jesus' day, Jesus was a threat. Somehow, they didn't really like him. They didn't know him and maybe they didn't want to. He didn't match up with who they thought he should be as a teacher, a prophet, or a messiah. They were looking for a leader who looked like them, a really religious person, a respectable person, a powerful person, someone you could look up to, not somebody like Jesus. You know, I wonder sometimes how many of us in the mainstream North American church would respond to Jesus. Not the Jesus we think we know, but Jesus as he perhaps really was. To start with, I'm not sure that Jesus would even recognize this thing called the church, this thing that bears his name. And I wonder what Jesus would say to us today, even if he did find his way into one of our churches. Sometimes I think that he would say things that might be very similar to the things that he said to the really religious people of his day. And if we met the real Jesus, not the Jesus we think we know, how would we respond? Maybe we wouldn't like him very much either. Maybe we'd dismiss him or ignore him or start spreading rumors about him. Or maybe we'd miss him altogether because he just didn't match up with our idea of who Jesus should be. Maybe we wouldn't want Jesus hanging around at all. Come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You know, we hear that passage, that familiar passage, in a certain way. And maybe we hear it in a certain way because we are part of a certain group of people. I think most of us would acknowledge that, that we're part of a fairly, privileged, a, pr a fairly privileged group here in North America, that we're part of a distinct group as churchgoers, even within that culture. And we hear it through the lens of the Jesus that we think we know. So we hear it in a certain way, and probably not in the way that it was heard by the people who first heard Jesus. We hear those words, and we spiritualize them. Maybe we focus on emotional burdens. Jesus will comfort us. Jesus will lighten our burden. Or maybe we hear it in moral terms. Maybe we are burdened with sin and Jesus needs to save us from those sins. But the people that Jesus was speaking to knew what it was to carry heavy burdens. They were field laborers. They were fishers living in a world where life was hard and getting harder. And they knew what oppression was. They knew what fear for basic necessities and for basic security was. That's something that even in these difficult times, few of us can say that we've truly experienced. 
We hear that passage in a certain way, and we hear it through the lens of the Jesus that we think we know. But how might a a migrant farm laborer hear that passage? Someone right now, right here, today, someone that we may have driven past or walked by this summer or fall, working here in southern Ontario as a migrant worker, someone far from home, with no real rights to protect them, doing hard physical work that few of us would want to do. How would that person hear those words? And what would it mean to them? How might a single parent hear that phrase? Maybe someone holding down a part-time job at Tim Hortons or at Walmart, trying to raise a child on her own at the same time. What would that phrase mean to her? How would someone who has been racialized hear those words? Someone who has dealt with systemic prejudice and cultural oppression, or someone whose people have been the victims of cultural genocide, How would they hear those words? Someone who knows what it's like to carry the weight of a dominant culture that wants to weigh you down and keep you down every single day of your life. How would that person hear those words? We hear those words, come to me. Give me your heavy burdens. I'll make them light. I will give you rest. We hear those words in certain ways because of who we are and because of the privilege that we enjoy. But how would those words be heard by others who have been kept on the margins of our society? Well, I think maybe they would be heard in a way that is much closer to what Jesus may have really meant. And if we think about it, if we think about how some of those people that I mentioned might hear those words of Jesus, maybe that might help us to know Jesus a little bit better. Because this is how Jesus' words were heard. The people who listened and who followed Jesus. These were the people with whom Jesus lived because this is where Jesus came from. This is who Jesus really was. Because Jesus himself was on the margin. Jesus himself lived with those who felt that they were on the receiving end of oppression and stigmatization, of discrimination. This is the Jesus who really was. And as our churches decline, and as we are forced to think about the church, what it has been and maybe what Jesus meant for it to be, maybe think about where we went wrong, perhaps we are being invited to get to know Jesus in a new way. And maybe, just maybe, this might be one of the most important things that the church could be doing right now. Since we claim to be inspired by Jesus, to follow Jesus, since we love Jesus, and what Jesus was about, or what we think Jesus was about. Maybe it's time for us to come to terms with the Jesus we thought we knew, to pull apart some of those assumptions, and to ask ourselves why it might be easier or convenient for us to think about Jesus the way we do. Maybe it's time for us to come to terms with the Jesus we thought we knew. And maybe in doing that, we'll discover a Jesus that we never really knew 
at all. I heard the voice of Jesus say, Come unto me and rest. Lay down, thou weary one, lay down thy head upon my breast. I came to Jesus as I was, weary and worn and sad. I found in him a resting place, and he has made me glad. I heard the voice of Jesus say, Behold, I freely give the living water, thirsty one, stoop down. Jesus and I drank of that life-giving stream. My thirst was quenched, my soul revived, and now I live in Him. I heard the voice of Jesus say, I am this dark world's light. Look unto me, thy morn shall rise, and all thy day be bright. I look to Jesus, and I found in him my star, my sun. And in that light of life, Let us pray. Almighty God, each one of us comes here today virtually meeting and joining in spirit. With a week that's behind us with thoughts and cares and concerns, with a week that's ahead of us, with hopes, perhaps fears, perhaps wonderings. Oh God, help us to be present in this moment of prayer, to bring the week that has been and the week that will be, to bring our thoughts, our concerns, our intentions. For our community, O oh God, for the world, for our friends and neighbors and loved ones, and for ourselves. Almighty God, we bring these things to you now in the shared silence of this moment. Gracious Lord, we draw our prayers together as a family of faith, as a community of believers, and we lift them up to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Just 
waters flow down, down like a river, down to the valleys where the helpless cry. Righteousness flow through us forever, lead us to the streams that will never run dry. Flow to the mouths of the hungry, flow to the hands of the poor, flow to the hearts of the orphans, the casualties of war. Let justice flow down, down like a river, down to the valleys where the helpless cry. Righteousness flows through us forever, lead us to the streams of will never run dry. Flow to the streams of the homeless, finding no place they can go. Flow to the cells of the prisoners, who face each day alone. Let justice flow down, down like a river, down to the valleys where the helpless cry. Righteousness flows through us forever, lead us to the streams that will never run dry. Flow through the courts of our nations, guide us in love's decrees. Lead us by streams of salvation, flood our land with peace. Let justice flow down, down like a river, down to the valley where the helpless cry. Righteousness flow through us forever, lead us to the streams that will never run dry. Let justice flow down, down like a river, down to the valley where the helpless cry. Righteousness flow through us forever, lead us to the streams that will never run dry. Lead us to the streams that will never run dry. And now, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the companionship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, now and forevermore. Amen.